Well, hello, my friends, and welcome back. My name is Stephanie Safarian, and you're listening to episode 413 of Sustainable Minimalists. This is a show about intentional and eco-friendly minimalist living. I'm super excited about today's show because we're discussing something every single one of us experiences, and that, of course, is stress. Why are Americans among the most stressed in the world, and how can we incorporate some ancient wisdom to reduce our chronic stress issues. And we're doing that today because some researchers argue that most health problems are caused by exposure to chronic stress. Now, worldwide, Americans, we do experience stress most of all, and this is a major problem because stress can shorten your lifespan, so it affects the quantity of days you spend on this earth, while simultaneously also wreaking havoc on the quality of your days. So quantity of your life and quality of your life is deeply affected by chronic stress. Now, what really gets me about conversations about stress is that high levels of stress nationwide is a public health problem, isn't it? And yet, here in the United States, we just accept that stress is a part of our life. It's almost as though the messaging is, yep, we all have high levels of chronic stress and we all just have to learn to live with it. But spoiler alert. Not all countries and not all lifestyles take this approach. The Japanese in particular, they report experiencing significantly less stress, and they also happen to live longer, they're healthier, and they report living happier lives than us Americans. So on today's show, we're taking some Japanese wisdom and we are applying it to our decidedly American lives. We're not packing up our belongings and moving to Japan, (laughs) but we are hopefully, fingers crossed, borrowing a few concepts from ancient Japanese philosophy into our way of life for, of course, less stress. Now I have a two-part show for you today. Part one, we are seeking to understand the physiology of stress. What exactly is happening inside our bodies when we experience a stressor? What does chronic stress actually mean? What's happening inside us? But more specifically, why are Americans experiencing more stress than people living in other countries? What is it about our culture that's encouraging stress to fester? That's part one. There's a lot in part one, I know. And then in part two... We're nailing down those six Japanese concepts that may hopefully help us as we seek to reduce our own levels of chronic stress. So let's get right into part one where we're discussing the physiology of stress. Let's just lay it all out on the line right at the outset. Stress affects all systems within our bodies, our musculoskeletal systems, respiratory, cardiovascular, endocrine, gastrointestinal, nervous, reproductive, all of them affected by stress. So here's what happens when we get stressed, okay? An alarm bell goes off in our brains. Our brains then activate the pituitary gland. The pituitary gland when activated, produces hormones that release corticotropin. This corticotropin then circulates all throughout our body. The corticotropin activates the adrenal gland, and the adrenal gland is triggered to release adrenaline and cortisol. We all know adrenaline and cortisol, don't we? Adrenaline is what's responsible for raising our pulse and our respiratory rate. It also gets our muscles ready to act, ready to contract. While cortisol increases dopamine and blood glucose, that's what gets us charged up and again, ready to act. Now, in moderation, all of that happening inside us is beneficial. We do not want to be zenned out when we're faced with a credible threat, right? We want to be ready to act, to fight, to flee, to fawn, whatever we're going to do, we want to be ready for it. But the problem is, of course, as with so many of our problems in 2023, these days, the stress we're facing is constant. All day, every day, we look forward to that week-long vacation to you know, lower our stress and get back to ourselves. But a week here or there, a week of vacation here or there, it's just not enough of a respite. 
Enter chronic stress. Chronic stress is that sustained state of stress. It affects our neurons associated with memory. It impacts the release of certain hormones, which can cause or exacerbate depression. It can lead to chronic fatigue. So if you're one of those people who sleep eight or nine hours and you still wake up tired, you may have chronic stress to blame. Chronic stress affects the muscles in your body. So remember that adrenaline gets our muscles ready to act. When you're experiencing chronic stress and your muscles in your body are in a more or less constant state of guardedness, your muscles are taut and tense for extended periods of time, which triggers other reactions in the body and promotes stress-related disorders such as tension-type headaches, migraines, chronic muscle tension in the shoulders, neck, and head. Chronic stress, of course, can contribute to long-term problems for your heart and blood vessels, constant increase of heart rate, and the elevated levels of those stress hormones can increase your blood pressure and over time perhaps lead to hypertension or heart attack or stroke. Stress affects your gut. It is associated with changes in gut bacteria, which in turn can influence your mood. It can affect your reproductive system in really concerning ways. We won't go into all those ways today. I think I'm making my point. My point, of course, being that stress affects every system in your body. And before we move along, just a couple more. Stress literally makes you age faster. It makes you get older faster. It makes you look older. And that's because stress damages healthy cells and leads them to age prematurely. I read an interesting study that looked at 39 women. So 39 women who had high levels of stress due to the fact that one of their children had significant health issues. So 39 women, each of them had a child who was very sick. They compared these 39 women with women who were not experiencing extreme stress. They had healthy children, and they found that stress weakened the cellular structures called telomeres in the super stressed out women. The greater the stress, so the more significant the stressor, the greater and faster the degeneration of cells. So stress literally damages and ages your cells prematurely. Now, those are all the primary effects of stress, but of course, there's secondary effects of stress as well. Irritability, mood extremes, insomnia, I could go on and on. And so researchers into the physiology of stress argue that a little stress is good for you. Low levels of stress can be beneficial. A 20-year study did find that people who maintain a low level of stress, live longer, yes, but they also develop healthier habits. So they don't take up smoking, they drink less alcohol, all of which leads to a longer lifespan. Now, how prevalent is stress in America? I already alluded to it in our intro, but a 2019 Gallup poll found that Americans are among the most stressed people in the world. In the United States, 55% of respondents said they had felt a lot of stress the day before. 55%. That might not sound like a lot to you, but consider that the global average to that question was only 35%. Gallup's research, of course, did find that lower-income Americans tended to report even more stress, and younger Americans, so between the ages of 15 and 49, that was the definition according to the Gallup poll, younger Americans were the most likely to feel stressed or worried or angry. They were also shown to have disproportionately high rates of anxiety and loneliness and depression, which can often be tied to stress. Now, before we get into the why, I just want to distinguish stress from anxiety because I have gotten this wrong in the past. I always say I have anxiety. But as I learned the difference in preparation for this episode, I don't actually think I have anxiety. I just think I have high levels of chronic stress. 
So stress affects everybody on this earth in varying degrees. It results in dozens of symptoms that we just discussed, anxiety being one of the symptoms. And your ability to manage stress will vary depending on the person. Anxiety, on the other hand, is, again, a symptom of stress. Anxiety is the persistent and unrelenting worry The key here is that anxiety is the persistent and excessive worries that don't go away, even in the absence of a stressor. So I hope I made this distinction between stress and anxiety clear there. But let's get into the why. Why are Americans more stressed than everybody else? Well, it seems to me that Western culture is set up in ways that allow stress to fester, and for five reasons. First, There's all of our problems. There's constant economic upheavals. There's the political divisiveness, which at the moment, as of this recording, has created a government, a House of Representatives specifically, that's not working. There's racial injustice. There's gun violence and mass shootings. There's, of course, climate change. These are all major stressors. Prior studies have found that finances and Health and health care and politics and current events are among the leading stressors for Americans. However, people all across the globe are facing major stressors such as climate change and political upheaval and economic issues as well. So these headlines stories, I would say, these headline stories that are stressing us out, they don't tell the full story, do they? Because again, we're all facing them. To varying degrees. And so another reason why America is so stressed out, according to psychologist Meg Van Dusen, is that our stress has something to do with our diminishing attachments to one another. She believes that relationships are a kind of stress buffer. So think about the ocean, right? And think about the coastline. Coasts help prevent erosion. I would love it if you took this really interesting metaphor that I'm using here (laughs) and apply it to relationships. They provide a sense of safety in the midst of a storm. So that coastline is the relationship. It's preventing the erosion, right? And if you don't have the healthy coastline, you will be more exposed. Same with relationships, right? We need strong relationships within our lives to be that buffer for when life gets stressful. However, here in America, we're rugged individualists, as well as the fact that we're not as attached to one another as people in other societies and other cultures are. We'll talk about that in part two of today's show. But Van Dusen also suggests that reason number three, we're stressed out more than others, is the cell phone. So yes, the cell phones are a means by which we are no longer connecting on that deep level with other people. Sending somebody a text message does not provide the same sort of stress buffer as going out for coffee with a good friend and looking at them in the eyes and really forming a deep attachment and fostering that connection with that person, maintaining that connection. Texting them and saying, hey, how's your day? It's not the same in terms of interpersonal attachment. So there's that. The cell phone is interfering with that deep connection that we all need if we're seeking to reduce chronic stress. But the other reason has to do with our evolution. For modern humans, you and me, we tend to, our brains tend to, associate the ping of a cell phone as the same type of threat as a predator, as a saber-toothed tiger. Recent research finds that over half of individuals from Generation Z use their smartphones for five or more hours per day, and a quarter use their phones 10 or more hours a day. That is all time in which we're not engaging with each other directly. That is five hours a day at the minimum in which we're in a constant state of threat. Mind-blowing. Another potential reason why Americans are more stressed than people in other parts of the world is because here in America, you know it to be true, we live at a frantic pace in a near constant state of competition. Stress then becomes the natural physiological response. 
We have an us versus them mentality, don't we? In politics, of course. Oh my goodness. And we have an election coming up. In issues of race, we tend to view the other as a threat to our own security. And we tend to take this to ridiculous levels, don't we? Watch your thoughts the next time you feel jealous. Let's say your friend and your neighbor, they just bought a new boat and it's parked in their driveway. If you feel 100% happy for your neighbor, I'd say you're amazing and you're also in the minority. Because if you feel even a twinge of envy or jealousy, just like a little tiny bit, I invite you to examine that feeling. What is that envy or jealousy showing you about you? Perhaps the reason you're feeling that little twinge is because that big new shiny purchase makes you feel less than or behind in the competition of life. Everything's a competition, or at least we perceive everything to be a competition. None of it's actually a competition, but our culture is set up to find competition when there is none. And so when we're living at that busy pace and also in a constant state of competition, enter chronic stress. And then the final reason I have for you today is our perfect setup into a calmer, slower way of life, which is, of course, perhaps we're so stressed out because of existential crises. Existential crisis is common in societies in which, by and large, its citizens do what others do and what they're told to do rather than what they want to do. There's a term I came across. It's called Sunday neurosis. Sunday neurosis describes the emptiness that some of us face when we have a quiet moment, a quiet Sunday to ourselves, and we realize in the quiet that we don't have a purpose and we haven't nailed down the reason for living. Like, what is the purpose of this life? Why are we on this planet? Usually we distract ourselves from these existential questions because examining them can be difficult and scary and hard, right? We play on our phones, we put on the TV, we stay busy, 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 but enter Sundays when life gets quiet and these existential questions creep in. And if you haven't nailed down your purpose, if you haven't nailed down your reason for living, that existential crisis can indeed contribute to chronic stress. So we're going to move into today's ad break, but when we come back, I have six ancient Japanese concepts that we are going to hopefully apply to our busy and stressed out lives. I'll see you in a minute. You trust your water filter pitcher to make your tap water safe to drink, but is it really doing anything? Most filters just can't remove gross contaminants like bacteria and parasites and PFAS and microplastics. I could go on and on. I trust my water filter pitcher for water that's safe for my family to drink. And if the brand I bought isn't doing what it advertised to do, that makes me feel so frustrated. Enter LifeStraw Home. LifeStraw Home is the kitchen upgrade you will wish you made years ago. It's the only water pitcher that filters out over 30 contaminants. It's made of glass, not plastic, and most importantly, for every pitcher sold, a child in need receives a year of safe water. Better filtration, better taste, better design. Use code SUSTAINABLE for 20% off your first purchase of any LifeStraw Home product at lifestraw.com. Cannot be combined with other offers. Have a full closet but nothing to wear? Armoire makes getting dressed so easy. With a clothing rental membership from Armoire, you can build the perfect fall wardrobe with brands that are high quality, unique, and recommended just for you. I'll be honest. I feel super guilty that I have items in my closet with the tag still on. I've never worn them. I'm never going to wear them. Armoire solves this problem for me. All you have to do is go to armoire.style slash sustainable, take your five-minute style quiz. Styles will show up at your door in as little as two days, and when you're ready for new clothes, you just swap them out for more new-to-you styles. Right now, my listeners can give Armoire a try and get up to 50% off their first month. That's up to $125 off. Just visit armoire.style slash sustainable 
A-R-M-O-I-R-E dot style slash sustainable to get up to 50% off your first month and never worry about what to wear again. Try Armoire today. And we're back on today's show. We're discussing stress and the stress response and why Americans are more stressed out than everybody else. My research in preparation for this episode has led me to believe that all of us, every single one of us listening right now, we all need to have an intentional and daily stress reduction practice. We all know stress is bad for us, but I'm really hoping in part one of today's conversation, I nailed down exactly why it's bad and exactly how bad stress is. The Japanese are among the longest living and least stressed people on the planet. And so it makes sense to me. It's just common sense, right? It makes sense to adopt some of the tenets of their lifestyle into our days. My hope for you is that you pick and choose some of these ideas that work for you and you leave the rest. And so Japanese concept number one for you today is to find your passion and pursue it. The Japanese have a lifestyle philosophy called ikigai, and ikigai is what gives your life worth and meaning and purpose. Ikigai is your reason for existing. And the Japanese do believe that nailing down your ikigai is the secret to that long and happy and stress-free life. This is vastly different from the Western way of life, right? We believe, or we're told to believe, that A happy and stress-free and long life is due to accumulating money and getting ahead. But the Japanese say, no, 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 wait a minute. The key to a long, happy, stress-free life isn't the accumulation of money and stuff. The key is to live your ikigai, live your purpose. Now, how do you find your purpose? We've talked about this a lot on the show before, but According to the Japanese, your ikigai is the common ground. It's like a Venn diagram with four circles, okay? It's the middle of those four circles between what you're good at, what you can be paid for, what the world needs, and what you love. That middle piece where all those circles intersect, that's your ikigai. That's your purpose. The Japanese say that you must. You have a duty to pursue your passion no matter what, even when it's hard and even when life is stacked against you. Now, the Japanese aren't the only people to say this. Austrian psychiatrist Viktor Frankl also believed that our modern malaise is due to the fact that not only are we not following our purpose, our ikigai, but many of us don't even know what our ikigai is. And so logotherapy, which was Viktor Frankl's psychological model, logotherapy is a means by which people can sit with a therapist and find their purpose. Because when they find their purpose as a side effect, they significantly reduce their stress levels, which significantly reduces the symptoms as to why they showed up for therapy in the first place. The insomnia, the ruminating thoughts, the depression. If you nail down the purpose and lay out a plan for living your purpose, all those secondary effects fade away. That's according to Viktor Frankl. The Japanese also say, too, when you find your ikigai, you got to live it and don't give it up. Those who retire, let's say, and give up the things they love to do and do well, they lose their life purpose. And that's why it's so important in Japanese culture to keep doing the things that you value, and also bring beauty to others. Even though you're at retirement age, whatever retirement age is, I hear all the time here in my daily life, well, when I retire, I'll do this, or, oh, I can't wait to retire because then I'll. The Japanese would never say that. Never. Because living is now. It's not once you quit your job. It's now. And so it If you're listening to me right now and you're saying to yourself, Stephanie, my passion, my purpose, my ikigai, it will not pay the bills. (laughs) I hear that. We all got to pay the bills, right? I suggest then for you, you try and make some money from your hobbies. See how that works for you. You might make zero money and that's 
okay if we're discussing Japanese philosophy. Remember that the goal is not to make a lot of money. The goal is to live your purpose because when you're living your purpose, you're reducing your levels of chronic stress, which then in turn will lead to a happier, healthier, longer life. This right here is where the profound lifestyle shift lies, isn't it? It's not about amassing money, even though our Western lifestyle tells us that money is everything. The Japanese say, hey, wait a minute. No, it's not. Money is not it. Money is not the end. Living your purpose is the end. So concept number two is to find a strong sense of community wherever you're at. Have strong social ties and form close bonds with others. Keywords close, not surface level. Oh, how are your kids doing? Oh, uh, oh, everything's good. So busy. No, those are not close bonds. Those are surface level acquaintanceships, okay? Close bonds. In Japan, they have things called moai. Moai are small groups that look out for the members of the group. They have meetings, let's say, and they play games, and everybody gives a small monthly financial contribution to the group. That financial contribution can be used for recreational activities. However, also, if you're experiencing a financial trouble, you can ask your moai for financial help in the form of a monetary advance, which, again, buffers you against the stress that comes with financial instability. The feeling of belonging and support that people get from these groups increases life expectancy. And so perhaps you go out and you try to form a moai, that would be an A-plus behavior, but if you're not there yet, perhaps you just focus on deepening the friendships you have, like make them stronger, make them deeper, make them more meaningful and less surface level. And if you're saying to yourself, but I don't have any of those, well, you know the work to do. Go out and make one. Go out and find one. And I know that's easier said than done, but it will indeed, research finds that it will indeed improve the quality of your life. Concept number three, you know I'm going to say it, so I'll just say it in the third spot. Meditate. Meditation is the number one way to learn how to observe your thoughts and emotions as they appear without getting carried away by them. Meditation helps you stop worrying about those things that you cannot control. Meditation will help you recognize and label your emotions. And this sounds really simple, like, oh, I can label my emotions. I'm an adult. But labeling the nuances, the intricacies of your emotions, that is very complex This is also a well-documented skill that's needed for chronic stress reduction. I've talked about meditation so much on this show before, so I'm going to leave it there. But again, this is the universe reminding you to start a meditation practice. And if your meditation practice has lapsed, this is the universe speaking to you through me (laughs) to pick it back up. Concept number five is to slow down. The Japanese believe that being in a hurry is inversely proportional to the quality of your life. There is an old saying, and it says, quote, walk slow and you will go far. When we leave urgency behind, our life takes on new meaning. We may find ourselves reframing the concept of time to perhaps time is actually on our side when we finally, once and for all, learn how to slow down. Unrelated but sort of related here is recent research into running. My long-term listeners, you know I try to stick in a running metaphor (laughs) in every podcast because I'm a big runner, and I must also say, too, running is my number one personal form of stress reduction. But there's recent research out now that says that you do not have to run as fast as you thought. You do not have to run for as long of a time duration as you thought to receive the immense health benefits that running gives you. Even if you just run really, really slow, so maybe slightly faster than a speed walk, 
If you do that for 20 minutes a day, so slightly faster than a speed walk for 20 minutes a day, the health benefits you'll receive from doing that are immense. I tend to think faster and longer is better, right? If running is good for you, let's do it for more time and let's go faster because then I'll get even more benefits. But no, research into running says that you can still receive benefits without, by the way, the stress on your joints if you just go slower and for shorter amounts of time. So slow down, literally and figuratively. And now moving on to concept number five, it is, of course, to reconnect with nature. I have been somewhat obsessed with (laughs) Japanese lifestyle ever since I interviewed Ben Page about forest bathing and Shirin Yoku. We discussed forest bathing in episode 384 of this podcast, and I'll link to it in the show notes if you missed it. But human beings are made to be part of the natural world. And so the Japanese believe we should return to nature often to recharge our batteries. Spending time in nature is recreation, yes, but it is also, and this is the key here, restorative and preventative medicine. So reconnect with nature, whatever that means for you. Do it often and even better daily. Profound stress reduction to be found there. And finally, when we're talking about chronic stress reduction, my final thought for you that I'm borrowing from the Japanese, of course, is to forget perfection. Instead of trying to make things perfect, find the beauty, learn to find the beauty in imperfection. This is what the Japanese call wabi-sabi. I love it, wabi-sabi. See the beauty of imperfection as an opportunity for growth. And so when I think about wabi-sabi, I relate this directly to the state of my house. (laughs) When my kids leave a mess all over the place, my stress level immediately rises. I feel it in my chest. Mess stresses me out. It just does. It's the way I am. And so when I see a gigantic mess that my kids left without cleaning up, my first impulse is to either clean it up or have them clean it up. But these days, I am working so hard on my own wabi-sabi. I'm working to stop and pause and take a deep breath and forget about perfection. Sure, my house is an imperfect and dare I even say disastrous mess. But let's flip the script. Messes mean, so my children making messes, that means that my children are playing. They're learning through play. They're smiling and they're laughing and they're enjoying their childhoods. And that to me is me finding wabi-sabi. It's finding beauty in the imperfection that is the state of my house. So let's recap very quick. If you want to adopt some Japanese concepts into your Western way of life for reduced stress, you're going to find your ikigai, you're going to find your passion, and you're going to pursue it. You're going to find and maintain and cultivate a strong sense of community. So you're going to deepen your bonds with others. You're going to meditate most days, if not every day, 10 minutes, that's all you need. You're going to start to slow down. Yeah, so everybody else is running all around doing crazy stuff, going from here to there to everywhere. When you ask people how they're doing, they always say, busy, oh, so busy, oh, life's so crazy. Not you. You're going to intentionally slow down, even though everybody else is running super fast in their own little rat races. You're going to reconnect with nature most days. And even if you live in a city, maybe that means just going to a park. And then finally, You're going to wabi-sabi your heart out. Forget perfection. Perfection is not where happiness and stress reduction and longer lives lie. All of that lies in learning how to find beauty and joy despite it being imperfect. Now, I do have a completely unrelated eco tip for you today. It comes from Donna. Donna says that when she is in a public bathroom and there are two rolls of toilet paper, she uses the smallest one, so the roll with less toilet paper on it, because that is the roll that the cleaning crew is likely to throw away the next time they're going to do their cleaning. So use the toilet paper on the smaller roll. 
awesome tip, Donna, that we can all do without (laughs) much thought or effort on our part. So thank you so much for sending that over. Listeners, we will be back tomorrow for headlines. Headlines, if you don't know what they are, headlines is our Friday show in which we're covering four to five need to know environmental news stories in 15-ish minutes. And I have some real good stories for you tomorrow. I'm just telling you now. I will see you then. As always, if you need me, please reach out. If you like the show, please review it. I so hope I gave you something to think about today. I so hope I helped you. I'll see you tomorrow and take care.